When I was a teenager, I dreamed of being a songwriter, but my problem was that I didn't have any imagination. I could only write songs about things that were happening right in front of me, uh, like a song I wrote when I was about 15 called Drunk Tramps. Uh, in, <laughs> for my people, a tramp is a, is a hobo. Uh, drunk Tramps. Um, and it was, a, it was a song about drunk tramps being ignored by businessmen. And it went, drunk tramps ignored by businessmen. <laughs> they walk right by you, don't even see you. But you're the special ones. Anyway, I was living in a... <laughs> I was living in a squat in North London with a man called Shep who would smash all the crockery every time Arsenal lost. He'd like, he had the dreadlocks and he'd like throw the crockery uh, across the room like some kind of disturbed Highland Games competitor or Dothraki from Game of Thrones. And I'd stand in the doorway and I'd think he's so mentally ill. It was exciting. Um, so because I couldn't be a songwriter, instead I became the entertainments officer of the Polytechnic of Central London, my college. And one day I was in my office and the phone rang and this voice said, um, I was, uh, this is when, before I became the entertainment officer, this is when I was shadowing my predecessor. And the phone rang and this voice said, Frank's supposed to be playing tonight, but our keyboard players had a nervous breakdown. And so we're gonna have to cancel, unless you know any keyboard players. And I said, I play keyboards. And he said, well, you're in. And I said, but I don't know any of your songs. And he said, can you play C, F and G? And I said, yes. And he said, well, you're in. Come to the sound check at five o'clock. Uh, by the way, Frank's real name is Chris. So I went to the sound check and I'd done a bit of research by then and I discovered that Frank wore a big fake head that he never took off. And so I was looking at these men sort of fiddling with equipment in the shadows. And I was wondering which of them might be Frank, like maybe there'd be some sort of, uh, you know, sort of facial disfiguration or something. Um, and, and I started like, peering at them and then I saw another figure in the shadows and it turned to me and it was this man wearing a big fake head with two huge bug eyes staring and lips pursed and very flat hair. And... I was wondering, like, why was he wearing the fake head when there was nobody else in the room except for his own band? Um, so I, I went up to him and I said, um, Hi, Chris, I'm John. And there was silence. And I said, Hi, Chris. And silence. And then I said, Hello, Frank. And he said, Hello! And that's how I ended up in the Frank Sidebottom band. I've got a picture of um, me and Frank from the 1980s. There we are. <laughs> I tell you, nothing makes a young man feel more alive and on an adventure than speeding up the motorway at two o'clock in the morning next to a man wearing a big fake head. <laughs> if you want, I feel like Alice through the looking glass. If you want to know what uh, Frank sounded like, this is what he sounded like. I've got to have my way now, baby. All I know is that it's good. You look like you're fun to me. I opened up my lovely gums and watch out, cause here I come. You spit me right round, baby, right round, like a right round, right round, right round. You spit me right round, baby, right round, like a right round, right round, right round. You know you do, you really do. Thank you. Thank you. And it was marvellous. We supported uh, Gary Glitter. Is he famous in America? Uh, Pedophile, big silver um, suits. Uh, do you want to be in my gang? We supported Gary Glitter. Uh, and his, rude, his roadies were very mean to us. They said, you can't have any of our drinks and you're not allowed to use our lights. And um, whatever happens, stay off the hydraulic stage. And so under the head... Chris was seething, and so when we got on stage, he immediately jumped onto the hydraulic stage, which rose up above the audience, setting off smoke bombs, and he went, come on, come on, and then after the show, he ran off stage and Gary Glitter's roadies were like chasing him down the corridor, and he took off his head and uh, took off his suit, and he had his normal clothes underneath, and they just caught up to him, and they said, uh, have you seen Frank Sidebottom? And he went, yeah, he went that way. <laughs> 
Anyway, eventually uh, I was fired uh, for tax reasons. Um, Frank owed £30,000 uh, tax uh, and he stood up in court and the judge said, this is very serious, how would you like to pay? And he said, would a pound a week suffice, my lord? And the judge said, no, it would not. Um, I was, I was, so I was fired and I moved back down to London. By the way, our driver said the funniest thing that I have ever heard in my life, but I don't know if this joke's going to play in America or not. Can I try it and say, in the north of England, this is the funniest joke ever. <laughs> so we were in a transit van driving down to play a show in London, and, um, and so our driver pulled up on the Edgware Road in London, and he wound down the window and he said to a passerby, excuse, mate, and a man said, yes, and he said, is this London? <laughs> And the man said, yes. And he said, well, where do you want this wood? <laughs> I tell you, in Manchester and Sheffield, funniest joke ever. So I, I moved to uh, London to become a, a journalist. And I suddenly realized that instead of being through the looking glass, I was starting to chronicle eccentrics in a slightly exploitative way, I think, in my early 20s, like we would find eccentric people and we would kind of gently make fun of them and and I didn't realize it at the time but I think what I was doing was defining the boundaries of normality by mocking people on the outside of it I'd gone from being in this magical place to being a kind of conformist and I think that's what journalism does it it, it finds slightly crazy people and mocks them um, f so we don't feel so crazy. In fact, quite recently, I met a woman who was a guest booker on a TV show, uh, a Jerry Springer-type show, and she had got the hunt for the right sort of crazy person down to his kind of science. And what she would do is she would like, get the prospective guests on the telephone, and she would ask them what medication they were on. <laughs> and if it was a medication for something scary sounding, she said to me, like lithium. You don't want them to go on the show because what you don't want is them to go on the show and then go off and then kill themselves. Um, but if it was a medication for a kind of fun sounding mental illness, like Prozac, so that's perfect. Prozac implies they're just a little bit, because you, you don't want real exploitation, you want smoke and mirrors exploitation. So Prozac is the right sort, implies the right sort of madness to be entertaining for our benefit on daytime television. So I was doing this stuff for, I don't know, maybe a decade, finding eccentrics and writing about them so we could feel better about ourselves. And I remember one night I, I was uh, wearing a tuxedo in London because I had just failed to win uh, a radio award and I was outside with somebody else who had just failed to win, a comedian called Adam Buxton and we stood there and he said, do you know why we never win? And I said, why? And he said, because you and me, we're marginal. The, th the things that we like are marginal, we're marginal. And I thought, we are, we're marginal. <laughs> and soon after that, and this was maybe 15, 20 years after I last saw Frank, I was in the park with my son one day, and the telephone rang, and I picked it up, and his voice said, hello, and I said, Frank, and he said, yes, and I said, how are you, and he said, I'm well, and I said, Frank, will you put Chris on, and he said, okay, hello, John, <laughs> and he'd gone into retirement, but he was staging a comeback, and that's why he was phoning. And I knew from having watched the Blues Brothers what was going to happen next, but it didn't happen. Instead, he said, would I write something in The Guardian to commemorate my time in the band? And he said he'd actually, for the comeback, he just had some new publicity photographs done, and he sent them to me. And in these publicity photographs, uh, you can see that time hadn't ravaged Frank. He looked exactly the same. So I wrote the piece in The Guardian, then my friend Peter Strawn said to me, um, maybe we should write a movie inspired by your time in Frank's band. And so we did, we wrote this movie called Frank. I don't know if anybody saw it with Michael Fassbender in it. Okay, one person. Let's get a marginal, a marginal movie for a marginal star. 
Um, so I was writing the screenplay, and so for two or three years, that was my life, was writing about Frank Sidebottom. And he was playing in London one night, so I went to see him. It was in a pub quite near where I lived. And I saw him backstage, and I said to him, wow, Chris, you've, you've lost so much weight. And he said, I know, and he looked pleased. And I said, well, what are you doing? He said, I don't know, it's just falling off me. And I said, well, whatever it is that you're doing, you look great. So I carried on writing the screenplay, and one day I went on Twitter, and one of the trending topics was Frank Sidebottom dead. And I wondered why Chris had decided to kill off Frank, and why Twitter cared enough to make it a trending topic. So I clicked on the link further, and I realized it wasn't Frank who was dead, it was, it was Chris. And neither one of us knew it when I'd seen him a few months earlier. Um, and told him how good he looked, but it was throat cancer. And in fact, a few weeks before he died, he posted on Twitter uh, a picture of Frank undergoing chemotherapy. So the next day, there was another article in the newspaper that said Frank Sidebottom to be buried in a pauper's grave. He had died penniless, and he was going to be buried in a pauper's grave. And I thought, what did that entail? Like a journey back in time, 200 years. So I sent out just one tweet saying that for a few thousand pounds, Chris could be spared a, a pauper's funeral. And by the end of the day, fans of Frank Sidebottom had donated 25,000 pounds, which was more than enough money to... It was more than enough money to bury and then exhume him and then rebury him and then... <laughs> re-exhume him. There was a bit of money left over and somebody else used that money and, and did another collection for a sculpture of Frank which was being forged in the Czech Republic and it was going to end its days outside Johnson's the Dry Cleaners in his local village. And he sent me a photograph of the, of the Frank statue on the way from the Czech Republic. And in this photograph, uh, Frank looks like he's been disturbingly kidnapped but is fine with it. And then the unveiling. And now when I think about Frank, the thing that comes into my mind most of all is this show that we did at a club in Dudley in the West Midlands called JB's. And it was very poorly attended. There kind of be more than 20 people in the audience. And uh, at one point, the audience split up spontaneously into two teams. And one of them brought out a ball. And ignoring us, they played a game of football. And a couple of days later, in the van, Chris was ruminating on that particular show. And he said, you know that show in Dudley? And I said, yeah. And he said, best show we ever played. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>